start recording. Mumba. Okay. So what we've seen in Hosea 1 and 2 so far, well, let me ask the class just for a little bit of review, and we're going to go do this for maybe five, five or seven minutes, okay? What were certain significant things that you remember from Wednesday's class, Oakland campus? Sella. Uh, the reason why he told, um, God told him to get uh, to find himself a wife of harlotry. Right. Um, because it was it was because of the land had committed. Very uh, good. Committed. Exactly. And so this is a what? What is this called? A it's a, a metaphor. Very good. So God commands Hosea, son of Beery, whoever he is, um, to to marry a promiscuous woman or a woman of harlotry, a woman, adulterous woman, an unfaithful woman, or even very specific, a cultic prostitute. We're not sure the actual word, but what it is, it's infidelity. It's infidelity. This woman is characterized by having more than one husband, okay? It's characterized as that. That's the context of the text, all right? And this, this marriage, this relationship represents a more complex relationship, a more difficult relationship to explain, which is what? Israel's covenantal relationship with God, okay? All right? So that is a metaphor. Excellent. That's exactly right. What else? What are our other things that were significant for you guys to remember from Wednesday's class. Waller, go ahead. Um, how, like, how exactly a woman was treated, especially an adulterous woman right. treated in that society? How and how were adulterous women treated in this society? Um, her, husband, her husband would either, or she would either be stoned, okay. or her husband would um, strip her in a public that's true. Exactly. So the punishment of adultery was a capital crime. It wasn't. It wasn't a crime of passion, nor was it a crime that was. Uh, that was the vic The the only victims of the crime were was the was the person the spouse. Okay. The act. It, it was actually a societal crime. A societal crime. It was a capital crime. And the two is that. Punishment was inflicted for adultery was A, stoning to death, okay, um, and B, or B, was to strip the woman naked to expose her shamefulness. Yes, Waller. Can I read the Quran that stripping her, even though it seemed like the worst one, because it's more shameful? Right, because you got to live with it, right? Yeah, it's actually the gracious one. Right? That's exactly right. And that's actually what our student Ace pointed out. Because there's two choices. One, to just kill her. Or two, there's even though even though the experience can be traumatic and embarrassing and shameful, she still gets to live, right? Excellent. So that was gonna bring that was gonna bring up my second question or my, my next question, which was which punishment did God choose for Israel, quote unquote, or for the adulterous wife? This was the shamefulness one, the one of stripping her naked and exposing her and so forth. But we need to understand in the text, in context, the end goal was not to give her shame. The end goal was for her to realize the unworthiness of her lovers, the lack of resource that her lovers have, so that she may return back to God. Okay? So the whole purpose of, of this language, this punishment language, was for repentance. Was for repentance. So the end goal is for her to realize, to realize what she's done and return back. Okay? And honestly, again, if you think about it, in this society, what kind of what kind of honor does a man, a head of household person, would have in this society to bring back an adulterous wife? Think about it. Is it is it a good honorable thing? No. 
It's a shameful thing. It's a shameful thing to welcome back an adulterous person or a shameful person, right? But God says, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Okay? So just imagine. So in this, in, in a way, in a way, Jose is very revolutionary. He kind of, he kind of shakes up this honor-shame system that Israel had. He goes, I don't care how shameful I look. I still want to keep a covenant relationship with my people. Okay? Brilliant. Good. Okay. Um, anyone else? Anyone else? Was there anything that was significant that you remembered from Wednesday's discussion? The man was barren. The, the land was barren. Okay. Continue on with that. He took away the festivals and moon moons and the celebrations. That, and these celebrations had to do with the harvest. Right. And when, if God... Uh, if he were to destroy these things, then the land would be, in, the land will have to be barren. Right. Very good. And in that barrenness, what what is the purpose of the barrenness? So this is another metaphor, right? What is the purpose of the barrenness? You think? Go ahead. No, no, no. You said something. Go ahead. Because of the blood. I don't remember. Because of the blood. I was thinking about the land and how, like... Oh, in the beginning. Like, yeah. In the beginning. Okay, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. Barrenness is it ever the end point. It's never the end point. Barrenness is just a reminder of what you once had and what you once had and the source of where you got it from. You got it from God, you return back to God. Okay, so there's this there's this journey from barrenness to fertility, to fruitfulness. Yes, Waller. Right. God is God is the man. Right. And so there's there's a theological concern with this metaphor, right? The theological concern is this that God as the male is better than the unfaithful woman. And so there's this gender inferior inferiority within the text. A gender inferiority. What are feminists saying about this text? They hate it. They absolutely hate it. They want to make they want to make Hosea a bad guy, and so um, and so. Uh, but they're trying to uh, moderate feminists because I can't I can't generalize feminists. You know what I'm saying? But like, there's certain feminists that say, okay, we need to understand it based on this ancient Near Eastern society and culture, and we need to emphasize how bigoted and and um, how masculine driven it was, right? So the emphasis is not really on the text. The emphasis is to showcase how how bigoted and masculine driven their society was rather than focusing on the text. Um, others would just say, okay, we know that. How do we use that to help us better understand the text? Mm -hmm. so, so there you go, okay? All right, what, do you, what about the blood? I know that the, the, the first name, one of the, the name of the, of the kids. Yeah, the first son. The first son. His name is Jezreel. what? Jezreel. Jezreel. Very good. Um, he named him Jezreel because the land, the Jezreel's land was very, uh, like it produced. Okay. It produced a lot of... The valley of Jezreel produced a lot of crops, and it got polluted by innocent blood. Right. Very good. Very good. And this is one of the reasons why the Jehu dynasty would be exterminated. So, Okay? Cool. All right. So we went through Chapter 2 as well. Now let's get into Chapter 3. Let's get into Chapter 3. Chapter 3 is very short. So who wants to read 1 through 5? Go for it, Waller. The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is adulterous, love her as the Lord loved the Israelites. Though they run to other gods and is the love and love the sacred risen cakes. And so I bought her for fifteen shekels of silver, and I bought a homer and a lethic of barley. Mm -hmm. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man. I will behave the same toward you. 
For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessing in the last days. All right, excellent. So what we have here is the... Verse 4 and 5 is the reason for what was done previously, okay? And what's happening previously? What is God telling Hosea to do? Build for verse 4 and 5? Yeah. Verse 4 and 5 is the explanation of why Hosea is doing what he's doing in verses 1 through 3, okay? And what is Hosea doing verses 1 through 3? He's showing his, love, his wife love again by buying her. With silvers and about a homer of Aleppo or Okay, so here, apparently in this, now we don't have the full picture, but based on what it says in verses 1, you have a slow connection. Would you like to hide all webcams and stop sharing your webcam? Yeah, just, just in case so that everyone will know. All right, so in this story, what it looks like is that it looks like, and what's the name of his wife? Gomer, Gomer daughter of Deblion, right? Gomer, it seems like Gomer returns. Not returns, or... I have a question, because yeah. the text never says she went off. Right, exactly. So and so again, what are they talking about? So apparently in the beginning there's a gap. There's a gap. And so within that gap, this is this is the explanation. Gomer chooses to live under another man's house. How how would we know that? We don't. And so there lies the problem. This is this is trying to better explain the situation okay this is trying to better explain the situation so gomer chooses to live under another man's house all right and then that's the gap that's the gap and then we're here go show your love to your wife again though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress this this kind of makes the situation more complex you know this is this makes it more complex why is the man and her still alive and so forth and whatnot, it goes into the it goes into the complex degrees of how punishing adulterers work, which I don't have. I don't have that information. But let's just take it as best as we can. This is happening. Okay? This is happening. So basically, what does that convey? It conveys that Gomer is under the protection of Gomer is under the protection of another man, okay, other than Hosea, okay? Gomer is under the protection of another man under Hosea. Now, what does Hosea need to do in order for her to be reclaimed by Hosea? Buy her back. Buy her back. What's the word for that? Prostitution? No, not prostitution. Oh. When do you when you buy a slave back? Huh? That's right. That's exactly yeah. right. Hosea is redeeming Gomer. And how does he redeem Gomer financially? What does that convey? He needs to invest. He invests. Uh, what's the word? He loses profit in order to reclaim or redeem an unfaithful wife. There's no promise. She has not agreed 
to the promise of remaining faithful. Keep that in mind. He just has to go and redeem Gomer financially without any decision made by her yet. That's the first thing. You redeem first. Then he tells Gomer, we must, you must live faithful to me, and I'll behave the same ways to you. She doesn't answer back. She doesn't answer back. Okay? So, going back to honor and shame society, Hosea is literally paying to reclaim an unfaithful woman without any assurance of commitment or assurance uh, that the fact that she will abide to it. Okay? Even in this society, Hosea is the loser. We have to understand that. Hosea is the loser right now in this society. Why? He has to go to the winner to reclaim what he lost. Okay? That's what's happening right now. So in this idea, Hosea basically he is living in shame. Hosea is living in shame. Why? Why is he living in shame? He goes back to the man who committed adultery with Gomer. And he says, hey, I want to buy her back. Okay? I know I lost. I know I lost here. But I want to buy her back. It's like, what if she does it again? I don't care. Mm -hmm. I want to buy her back. So, just, okay. So she's with, she's with Hosea and she's marrying Hosea. Yes. Then and apparently in this gap situation, Gomer chooses to live under another man's house. Okay. She chooses to live under another man's house. Uh -huh. And the only way for Hosea to get her back is for him to pay for it. To him for to pay and for so it. So does the does the person, does the man that has Gomer in his house, does he have the right to say no, she's not for sale? That's true. That's true. But apparently in the story, he allows it. So she was really something she was to all of them. Very good. Very good. Because so in this really society, to say, yeah, I'll take your money. You can have money. because yeah. So he finds because he he knows he has an adulteress in her house, yeah. right? Maybe we don't have the motivation of the other man, but maybe he wants to reclaim his honor mm -hmm. and say, okay, I'll take this money. I'll take this financial gain for you to get this out of my to they, to solve my problem. Can they also? Away the woman from wanting to come to their house? Yes. So it might be that way because he didn't turn her away the, the first time. Right. So one happened. of the reasons one of the things that I can think of is why would why would anyone knowing that she is an adulteress, why would anyone take her? Take her? My guess is that it's it's her father's household. It's her father's household. It, it, it's because we're just, it's Gomer, the daughter of Deblium. It's probably Deblium. It, it, so, it sounds to me the most logical person that would accept her would be her father. Yeah. It'd be Deblium. Right. Yeah, like, right. Right. So, wow. but in the text, it sounds like this is the person, though, that she, she committed adultery with. Hmm. So, so there's a gap here. And, Right. Well, there's a gap here, and we just have to understand that. But what we need to understand is this. This entire process of redeeming Gomer back is an expression of living in shame. Hosea is living in shame. Okay? Hosea is living in shame. This is a metaphor of God not caring about how shameful his name is or how 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 much of his name is sullied in the dirt because of Israel oh. he's still willing to live in that shame to reclaim Israel back okay so knowing this very machismo man-centered society 
we see that God is doing rather the opposite. That he says, I don't care about my honor. I don't care at this present moment. I don't care about the honor of my name and how all the other neighboring nations think of me. What I care about is to remain faithful in covenant relationship with Israel. And one of those things that I promise, this is God saying that, is that I will reclaim her. Yes. Living in shame. We say this and then we see how God reacts to the shame. We right. see how God re reacts to the to the orphans. We see how God reacts when he died on the cross for us and things like that. Right. So we see it as shame. We see it as, oh my gosh, we see it as pity mm -hmm. and losing. Mm -hmm. But God sees it as I don't care or right. I, I'm at the end of the day. He's I'm above seeing, human. I'm, a, I'm above inferior. all yeah. these yeah. things. So yeah. so um why do we have to call it shame if we know that God is just like I'm I'm a, I'm unbothered by all of this. Right. I'm just doing it because I know I love my people. Right. I think I think we call it that so that we see how 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 much of a magnitude God is. How great God is, you know, because this is all a metaphor, isn't it? This is all a metaphor. So in our metaphor, this is a shameful thing to do. Hosea did a shameful thing, right? Mm -hmm. In our metaphor, God does this constantly. God does this all the time, you know? And so in our metaphor, what we're saying is, he, is that he doesn't care. He doesn't care about his honor. He doesn't care about his shame. All he cares about is having his real return. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's continue on. Four through eleven is the major portion of Hosea. Okay. Four through eleven is a major portion of Hosea, and four through eleven um, uh, goes into the father-son relationship. All right. So the metaphor of the husband and wife transitions to the father and son in 4 through 11, okay? Now, the message of 4 through 11, Mayor, are you saw this? Yeah. The message of 4 through 11 is a little more dire because imagine this. It's, it's a message to deaf ears. It's a message to deaf ears, meaning that no matter how much Hosea is proclaiming to the northern kingdom, these truths, the northern kingdom is not listening to them, okay? But there's certain major themes in 4 through 11 that recur over and over again, and it is first and foremost, I no, actually not first and foremost, I think it revolves around one word, idolatry. Chapters 4 through 11? Yeah, idolatry, okay? Now, idolatry... In the, in the first understanding of this word, idolatry is what? Religious unfaithfulness, right? That you worship other gods. Okay? Right, and that's true. You're, and, and remember how I told you the background information of Hosea, that from the very beginning of the northern kingdom's birth, they were idolaters. They said... They said, we're not going to worship in the Jerusalem temple. We're going to worship at two of our temples, Bethel and Dan. And what did they have in those two temples? Calves, calves golden calves. Because why? These were, these were the gods that saved us out of Egypt, right? Okay. So from the very beginning, they committed idolatry or worship of other gods, right? Good. But then there's also another aspect of idolatry that is more earthly. And what it is, it's, it's trust in politicians. Trust in politicians, okay? But the way that Hosea talks about it here, these politicians are corrupt and selfish. They're only thinking of themselves. They're only thinking of their... Uh, they're only thinking of their own good. They're not thinking about everyone else. Okay? Another aspect of idolatry is trust in foreign empires. Okay? 
particularly in this context, trusting in Egypt. Because remember, what's going on in the north? Assyria is slowly, slowly Handling. conquering and so forth. It's almost as if they see Assyria in their backyard, okay? They need protection. Instead of going back to God and saying, help us, Lord, the politicians are going to Egypt, are going to Egypt and saying, Egypt, we need an alliance with you. Help us, protect us from Assyria. And what did Egypt say? Oh, sure, we'll protect you. Just give us money. Just give us money, right? And then Assyria is kind of held back because why? They say, Assyria, don't destroy us. And what does Assyria say? Okay, we won't destroy you. Just give us money. So you have on one side giving money to Egypt to protect them from Assyria. You have another side, them giving money to Assyrians so that they won't be destroyed by Assyria. Yes, exactly, in the syro my war. So there's three places, three places they have to give money, okay? And then where does that money come from? Can you make money in a money factory? Exactly, exactly. They raise up the taxes. The rich hate it, but they say there's nothing we can do. We're not like in a democracy or anything. So what do we do? We exploit the poor. We exploit the poor. So instead of giving a, giving a, and so how many guys do work study or how many guys work? How many guys work? Where do you work, Alex? Uh, work study in the gate. Okay. Do you, how much do you get paid for it, if you don't mind me asking? You can do a fake number if you want. Like 12.25. 12.25 an hour. Okay. And how long do you do that for? Uh, two hours, uh, three days a week. Two hours, three days a week. Okay, so six hours altogether. All right, so that's, okay, that's great. So every two weeks you get a paycheck, Alex? All right. Hey, Alex, your paycheck's coming up, but I tell you what, there's this going on in Egypt, that going on in Assyria, and we have this war happening over here. Tough times, tough times. And you know the government. The government is just raising up taxes, I can't feed my family. I got to cut your check by a quarter. Can you do that for me? No. By a quarter as in 25 cents or by a quarter as in 25 you, you're, cents? I'm cutting 75% of your check. Well, uh, F you. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. In, in America, we can do that. Thank God for unions, right? But no, not in Israel. Not in Israel, right? They didn't have those kinds of forms of protection for the employee. That's exploitation, <laughs> okay? So when you don't have the money to feed your family, your baby is crying, your 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 children are bloated because they're not because they're malnourished, your wife is crying and so forth. What would compel a man to do to protect them? Go steal. Steal the food. There's nothing else he can do. Steal it. All right? So when this happens, there's an increase in crime. There's an increase in crime. And people devour each other. That's the metaphor. But people kill each other for the sake of bread. And so Hosea is seeing this. And Hosea is asking himself, is this really what God intended for his society? No, absolutely not. And what is the reason? We are idolaters. Jeez, what's all that going on to? Who has money just to buy back an unfaithful wife? Very good. Very good. So it's, it's again, like this, this person is considered lowest on the totem pole in society. Exactly. Exactly. So, cool. Idolatry. Worship of other gods. That's very true. Idolatry also means trust in politicians. I'm not trusting in God. I'm trusting in my politicians, which happen to be corrupt and selfish, right? And then I'm trusting not only God again, but I'm trusting foreign empires as well, okay? What is the root of idolatry? And I know we talked about this on Wednesday, but I really want to make this an emphasis because I still think this is a prevalent factor in human society today. What is the root of it? Convenience. 
Convenience is the root of idolatry. It's easy. It is easy to be an idolatry. It's easy to trust politicians when politicians say, oh yeah, I'll give you free college. Oh yeah, I'll give you free medical care. Oh yeah, I'll give you all these free things, Bernie Sanders. Just kidding. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, I'm gonna make a giant 10 foot wall all across the southern United States. Oh yeah, I'm gonna bring jobs. Oh yeah, I'm gonna profile people of different religious, you know, it's convenient. Oh, and not only that, I'm going to do it the first day I get into office. Convenience, convenience, convenience. That sounds good. That sounds super easy. Sign me up. Okay. Convenience rooted in selfishness. I want my piece of the pie. Help me get my piece of the pie and I will worship you. Okay? Trust in politicians, worship of other gods. If you give this to me right now, I'll worship you. And the gods in their in their in their deception, say sure, I'll give it to you. Right? Convenience rooted in selfishness. What else did I say about idolatry? I got you. <laughs> it's convenient. It is motivated with selfish gain. And okay. it is ultimately worship of self. Right, exactly. So it's convenience rooted in selfishness, which is basically worship of the self. Excellent. Worship of self. That, in essence, is idolatry. Okay? Israelite, Israelite society, Israelite society, Israelite um, Christian society is an attack of the worship of self. It's an attack against that. All the commands, all the laws, all the teachings of Christ is an attack of worship of self. It's worship of one true God. Not just simply worship of other, because worship of other could be idolatry as well. It is worship of one true God. And the essence of that is this selflessness. Selflessness. Okay? So when a person who's not a Christian or a person who doesn't say they worship God as, or they see Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they do really good things, how many people know people like that? People that are atheists, people that are Buddhists, people are this, that, this, that. And what they say is, or they, they, they do these good things. They, 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 uh, they support their food shelter. They tutor. They do this. They do that. But why are they doing it? They probably won't admit it themselves. Why are they doing it? They're making themselves feel better about themselves. Convenience rooted in selfishness. No matter how altruistic and no matter how kind and philanthropic that action is, it's still motivated out of selfishness. And a lot of Christian evangelicals don't get that. Because they too are, are idolatrous. Why do we worship on Sunday? Why, why do we evangelize on the streets? Is it really because for the glory of God, or is it really because it makes me feel better about myself? Oh, God wants me to do it, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to show how faithful and loving my, I am to God. Okay? A lot of Christian evangelicals get stuck here. When in the reality of it all is this, and you'll know when it's genuine or not. Everyone has that discernment. Why does everyone have that discernment? Because everyone has the Holy Spirit. You'll know when a genuine person says, when you ask, why are you doing this? You'll know when the genuine person says, because Jesus Christ. That's it. It is because Jesus Christ I do it. That's right. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. People will have that discernment. People will have that discernment. People have that discernment, okay? You guys, will, all of you have that discernment. It's called the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know what I'm saying? 
but it's because of Christ I go out. It is because of Jesus. It's because of this. It's because of this. No, it's because of Jesus I do it. Cool? All right, let's stop right now. It's 9.01. Let's take a 10-minute break, come back here at 9.11, and we'll uh, finish up one more chapter in Hosea, and then we'll talk about Joel. Yeah. Okay. LA. Let's go through one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. Really? Chapter 11, yeah, because this is, in essence, the message of Hosea. But this has been... This has been a constant reminder to me of God, okay? God is awesome, um, especially reflected here. Hosea 11, Hosea 11, who wants to read verses 1 through 4 for me? Hosea 11, 1 through 4. Go for it, Monica. It's okay. Break out of it. Especially if you're going to be a pastor or something. Uh, no, I don't want to. Actually, I don't think I want to do ministry after all. Oh. When is it more time? I want. I want us to. I want us to really soak in Jose eleven. All right. So go for it. Okay. Uh, just to reiterate, one through what? Four. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. They sacrificed to Baal, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, talk, talking, taking. taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who held them. Healed. Healed them. So sorry. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feet. All right, excellent. So, you, verses 1 through 4 is kind of a, a brief, brief history of Israel during what part of Israel's history? Can you close the door, Carlos? I want to say Abraham. No, no it's Abraham. after that. After the Egypt. After the yeah. Egypt. Yes, exactly. So, what, what 1 through 4 is a brief explanation through poetry of Israel's history out of Egypt and in the wilderness, okay? Uh, when Israel was a child, when he was becoming the nation, when he was taking out of Egypt, what happens? I called my son, okay? So um, the whole idea at this present moment, God's love, may I erase this idolatry yes. stuff? God's love is connected to God's call. If God loves you, God calls you. Okay? Now, it depends on what context we're talking about. What are we talking about? Where did they come from? Egypt. Very good. So, what does this formula look like? In what context? Slavery. God's love means this. He always calls you out of slavery. One more time. God's love is connected to God's call. And God always calls you to get out of slavery. All right? And this, you guys... <laughs> is the essence of Old Testament. It is the message of the prophets. It is the message of the law. This it is his message. God, God loves you. That means God calls you. Ooh. And he calls you out of slavery. And it is a constant struggle with humanity over and over again. Why? Because we love slavery. We love it. We love it. We don't like thinking for ourselves. We don't like taking responsibility for ourselves. If we screw up in slavery, we blame the higher ups. Mm, that's so true. Okay? But God doesn't want you that. He didn't create you that way. God loves you constantly. And in that, he says, 
get out of slavery. Get out of slavery. Okay? All right. Continuing on. <laughs> but the more he calls them, what did the people of Israel do? They continue to walk farther away. And what does this walking farther away look like? Baal worship. Baal was convenient. Baal was convenient. A lot of his characteristics and a lot of his character was similar to Yahweh. What made Baal convenient? He had a physical portrayal. He looked like them. He looked not only like them, he was like the Brad Pitt of the time. He looked good. He looked, and if I can say, he looked sexy. You know what I'm saying? He, he, um, he was, he was the, he was the celebrity, all right? He was the demigod celebrity, okay? So, um, <coughs> excuse me. And where is the end of that? There you are. Okay. So, he, it was convenient for them. It was convenient for them, okay? It made it easier to worship a god. Um, so the more he calls them out of slavery, the more they get into slavery. Verse 3, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. In the context that I'm sharing right now, what is healing? What is healing? What do you think healing is? Deliver, redeemed. Redeemed from, redeemed from what? This, remember, what's that, Nabil? Redemption from diseases, infirmity. It is a sort of redemption from diseases, infirmities, or anything that lacks the perfect health or perfect well-being. That's what it. That's what it means generally, absolutely. But in the context of Hosea one through four, what does it mean when he they didn't realize that they were healed? They didn't realize that they been set free. Good. That's exactly right. They didn't realize that they were set free. That's what healing means here. Okay? They didn't realize that they were being called to be set free from slavery. All right? You ever met a symptosomatic person? A person who always thinks that they're sick and physically becomes sick? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's apparently what Israel is doing. They thought they were enslaved, so they acted like they were enslaved. But in reality, they were healed. They were liberated. <coughs> Symptosomatic. What did they do? What is that? Thinking that they were enslaved. They reverted back to idolatry. So they were enslaved by that, by the idolatry. By the idolatry. Mm -hmm. So they didn't realize their liberation, and by doing that, it's showcased by them worshiping Baal. Carlos. I have a question I think is relevant to this. Okay. Um, do you think that the do you think that it's the, the responsibility of earthly rulers and governments to treat the subjects justly? Of course. So, but that's not that's not my idea. It's God's idea. That's right. the establishment of the law. Yeah. Um, and we know that they they rarely agree. Right. Right. Um, knowing that, like, do you think that it's the people's obligation or the their people's right to to speak up when the governments don't treat them justly? <laughs> no, you know what? Yeah, yeah. In American, uh, it was continued in American in American government philosophy, but it was still from God. You know what was the institute of it? The prophet. The prophet was the was the was the mouthpiece to evoke injustice. The, if if the king and the priesthood and so and the rulers did not do it. That's why the prophet was raised up. One reason why the prophet was raised up. So yeah, I say yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, one more imagery, and then we'll continue on. I um, 
It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it. I want you to imagine a loving father picking up their child, training them how to walk. That's the image that is evoked in the language here in Hebrew, okay? You have this father figure who's like crouching with their infant child, teaching them how to walk. Okay, it's supposed to be it's supposed to be beautiful. It's supposed to be intimate. It's supposed to be very connecting. Okay, and still they didn't listen to his call. All right, let's continue on. Four through seven. Who wants to read four through seven? Did you read already? All right, go for it, Carlos. <coughs> We're in chapter eleven. Okay. Eleven four through seven. Yes, please. No, five through seven. Excuse me. Five through seven? Yeah. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities, it consumes their oracle priests, and devours them because of their, of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the most high they call, but he does not raise them up at all. Okay. What translation do you have? NRSV. What a rebel. Bring an IV. Bring an IV. You can have the NRSV, but bring an IV, rebel. Please do. I don't know that saying. That was a foul. Five through seven in the new international Will they not return to Egypt and will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? A sword will flash in their cities. It will devour their false prophets and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me, even though they call me God Most High. I will by no means be exalted. Okay, so will they not return to Egypt and will not Assyria rule over them? How is that possible? If we take this literally, how can a people group be moved to one country and be ruled by another country? Because they kept paying to that to Egypt to help them, and then Assyria conquered. No. How could how could one one how could they be moved to one country and be ruled by another country? They can't. Don't take it literally. Okay? The, the first statement, will they not return to Egypt? That's the metaphor. And what does returning to Egypt mean? Going back to slavery. Going back to slavery. How are they going to go back to slavery? By being ruled over in Assyria. That's the literal. Okay? So don't take the entire statement literally. The first statement Will they not return to Egypt is a metaphor of returning back to slavery. The second statement is the actual thing that's going to happen. They will return in slavery by the Assyrian Empire. Okay? Not only that, not only that because they refuse to repent, not only because they refuse to repent, a sword will flash in their cities. It will devour their false prophets and put an end to the plans. My people are determined to turn from me. Even though they call me God most high, I will by no means exalt them. Exalt in this context means protect them. I will not protect them. Okay? Even though they call on my name, I will not protect them. Here's the background information that you need to understand and why Hosea, after this part, is so profound in chapter 11. God had every right to stop right there. According to covenant, the covenant relationship that he had, God had every right to extinguish Israel because of what they did and because of what they caused to do and so forth. He could have stopped at verse 11. He could have stopped when the Assyrians decimated them. He could have stopped when the Assyrians erased them out of existence. He could have stopped there. He could have erased them. It would have been convenient for God to erase them. Why? He still got two tribes in the south. I'll just I'll just create I'll just create my people through them. 
God had every right at this moment to stop at verse 7. Every right. And if he exercised that right, he would have stopped at verse 7. But there's more to verse 7, right? There's more verses, right? Mm -hmm. Who wants to read 8 through 11 for me? Go for it, Ebony. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? Adma. Adma. How can I make you like the Zeboyim? My heart has changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I turn and devastate Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come in wrath. Read to what? All the way to the uh, end of the chapter. Okay. okay. Uh, all the way to 11. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling for, from the west. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt, like doves from Assyria. I will I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. Amen. Wait. Go ahead. So, like, he's just, like, angry in one moment, ready right. to just be right. done. And right. then the next moment, he's like, but I don't even want to. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> now, <laughs> very good. Very good. Is God, is our God schizophrenic? Is our God bipolar? No. Our God is not bipolar. Here's the thing. You need to understand this. And you'll and once you understand this, you must challenge yourself as disciples to do so as well. God is not a reactive God. He is not a reactive God. He is a pro reactive God. Meaning this when God when you screw up, he doesn't react in his anger immediately. He is a proactive God. He says, when you screw up, okay, just wait. It's going to happen that you will destroy yourselves unless you repent. If you don't, you will destroy yourself. And then he'll say this, or he won't say this. He doesn't say this. Then I say this to people who just don't understand how much God loves us. I say this. He had every right to stop at verse 7. He had every right to erase humanity. He had every right to erase the ten tribes. But then he continues on and he says, what does he say? How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? You are my baby. You are my son. I taught you how to walk. I led you with, I led you with cords of kindness. How could I give you up? This is the message of Hosea. That God had every right to erase the northern kingdom, but he chose not to. He gave up that right in order for them to live. That's discipleship right there. He gave up the right to be angry. He gave up the right to eliminate in order for his creation to live. That is the message of Hosea. Is that not the message of Christianity? Yes. No. Message of Christianity. You fail, we stab you in the back. You fall down, we stomp you out. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is from my experience. Uh, what did you say? He gave up the right to be angry. He gave up the right to eliminate his creation. And he chose to let his creation live. Yes, Sam. Um, Can you say it like you did earlier? You said God had every right to destroy God had every right to destroy Israel. And then but he chose not to. Okay? That's the message of Hosea. That is the message of Hosea. Because of the stupidity of Israel reverting back to slavery, he had every right to cut them up. He had every right to destroy them. He had every right to erase them from history, but he chooses not to. He chooses not to. He gives up his rights. He gives it up in order for them, in order for them to continue on in their 
Hallelujah. I have a question. Somebody sure. Shopping. That I'm gonna throw a curveball here. Okay. It's throw. a hard question because I don't well for me it is because I don't have an answer for it, but maybe you do. Okay. Have some insight you can give me. But um so and I think this this might not be relevant to the topic, but it might because I'm not sure if the prophets mentioned this. Okay. They might, but I don't know. Um, like the, the Israelites that were in the wilderness. So, like, you know the whole concept of the remnant, right? Right. In the scriptures. Right. And then, so you have the Israelites in the wilderness, and some fell in the wilderness, the Bible says, but God saved the remnant. A remnant. Now, what I struggle with is, like, why did God have compassion on the remnant and not on the rest. What made the other ones that fell in the wilderness morally inferior to the ones that were saved? Oh. It had to do with their choice because the grumblers always said, let's revert back to, let's revert back to um, Egypt. Slavery. Let's revert back to slavery. At least we got fed there. At least we had housing there. At least we had clothing there. Let's just go back to slavery. And that was such a powerful idea that it spread within the it spread within the, the Israel camp. And it caused division. And then we have something called Poor's Rebellion and so forth and all that. And so what it is, it goes against antithesis. Antithetically, it goes against everything that God designed um, for his people. And so the idea here is, in my opinion, that, one, we have to put the God card in. In my, my uh, suggestion is that God knows the moral standard or the moral compass of every person. And God knew the moral, the moral um, uh, ruler that everyone, where they stood, and so forth, the plumb line. And so for those that were destroyed, quote, unquote, were the ones that, uh, in faith, I think, that weren't able, that weren't going to change. Um, also, also, it showcases the seriousness of division, how dangerous division is. It showcases also um, the willingness of how far God could go in order for, in order to quell, in order to stop uh, uh, division. So that makes sense. Now that you put it that way. So okay. in, in essence, you're saying that you have to do more with their their unbelief, like they never really believed. And and, and in the context of their unwillingness to enter into the unknown of freedom, yeah. they would rather go back to what they did know in slavery rather than continuing on in faith, which is belief that they're God of the unknown. So because the way I understand it, the Bible talks about it in terms of that they were unwilling to enter into the promised land. Right, which is another metaphor yeah. of their unwillingness to believe that God could provide for them. Okay. Yeah, because it happened throughout the entire wilderness story, even with the quail. A lot of people, the quail or the manna, a lot of them accumulated for the next day. And what happened? It all got moldy and rancid. Why? You need to trust God daily. You can't, you can't, you can't accumulate for the next day, not knowing what's going to happen the next day. Um, and also, when you accumulate, you also have more power than every other, everyone else. Why? You have more surplus than everyone else. What does that look like in unequal society? So. So yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to apply it to the broader, bigger picture of salvation. Okay, that's like I think that metaphor applies to Christians today. Yes, God saved us from Egypt. We were slaves in Egypt. Right, we slaves to sin. God right, brought us out of there. Right, into the promised land. But then sometimes, like as like speaking for myself, I know in like my individual Christian experience, sometimes like I want to revert back to Egypt. Yeah, because it like. It's convenient. I feel like I had it better there sometimes. It's like, convenient. It's comfortable. And it's like, you know, and, and sometimes, sometimes, and, and I, and then of course, it's a metaphor for like temptation. Sure. Idolatry. Idolatry. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you give in, but then it's like, okay, 
I guess the warning there is that, you know. The warning is this. when you If you continue giving in, uh -huh. you'll be consumed by it. And you will be destroyed by it. You know, or God will allow that destruction to happen in your life. You know, and the very fact that maybe you've experienced or people have experienced that said destruction and realize, wait a minute, there's something better. I need to come back to God. That's his grace. Because his, if his grace never existed in this earth, he would have just allowed you to be consumed by your, the, the, the destruction. He had, he had, he, you, you walked into it, or not you, just simply, every one of us would have walked into it. Yeah. What, gives, who, what gives us any kind of right to come back? Only the availability of God's grace. Only the available, availability of God's grace. So in that sense, we have it better than the poor core rebellion folk. Because they went through the, the, the fullness of, of God's destruction, which again, God can do. But the very fact that he provides each and every one of us, why me? Why me? That's the question to ask. Why do I deserve it? We don't. God just in his grace gave it to us. Cool? Cool. All right. So that's the message of Hosea. Thank you. Hosea 11 is this. God had every right to destroy rebellious Israel, but he gave up that right to save them. That's forgiveness too, by the way. Forgiveness is giving up your right, giving up your power over someone so that you can save them or so that you can be in harmony with them. Okay? Cool? Tov? All right. Let's then get into Joel. Let's do some intro to Joel. Joel, the short book. Are we, done with Hosea? we are done with Hosea. Oh my gosh. We, we, skip over like chapters. we skipped over a lot of chapters. But a lot of the chapters talk about the same thing. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm sure right, also read that it. Far. Just read it at home. Read your Bible. Read, read your Bible. What you guys like read the book in preparation for the class? What? Remember, I'll use that as a time to remind you guys. You guys got to read all twelve minor prophets, okay? So start. Joel's easy. Three chapters. Literally. No, that's too long. Five minutes. <laughs> five minutes of your time. Five Literally. Minutes. Yeah, it's super easy. Why do I keep rereading it? Because I was like, what is it talking about? Like that. Okay, all right, fine. Yeah, Granted, I, uh, yeah, I, I admire like, that. Like I admire that. Get the first chapter. <laughs> we can have it read to you, and you can follow along. It's I like way that. Easier. It's way easier. And you can do that. You can do that. Let's have a Bible reading time together. Mm, we're not supposed to. <laughs> we're all crickets. Um, <laughs> or locusts. Ah, I'm joking. No, it, it, as a matter of fact, we're talking about that. So, um, so okay, so let's see. Audience view. They. Why don't they see it? There we go. Did you ever teach, that? Did you ever teach minor talks before? No, this is my first time here. Did what? you get a lot of notes from Morgan? Uh, no, I didn't, unfortunately. This is your first time teaching minor prophets? Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. Appreciate it, Carlos. Huh? Because we could have fooled me. <laughs> All right. Carlos went in. Joel, a prophet for every generation. <laughs> okay? Dating of Joel. Oh, Ooh, he was dating? For a second, I'm like, I know. We why are we like, like, <laughs> Yes, he went on eHarmony or Christian <laughs> Mingle. Christian and he found, he found a nice woman, not Gomer, but. Uh, Shade. Anyways, so uh, dating. Here's the thing. We're not sure when Joel was written. We are not sure when Joel was written. Consensus of scholarship suggests this range, 500 to 350 BC. Really? Yes. Obviously, not one man could have done it. So maybe early on, around the 500s, Joel wrote it, and then it continued on with me, whoever adopted it, you know what I'm saying? But obviously not one person could have written it, okay? Or one person could have written it, and we just got to pinpoint when that date is. We just don't know. We really don't know. 
So that's the range, 500 to 350 BC, okay? Why do we say that? Why do we say that? Smarter scholars than me went actually into the text of Joel, and based on these evidences and more, but just worry about these, based on these evidences, it suggests this time frame. Point number one, it's a post-exilic experience based on chapter three, one through three. It's a post-exilic experience, meaning it happens after 586 BC, okay? And it also happens because there must be a temple. There's talk about temple worship, so it must have happened after 515 BC, okay? So that's the first reason. Second reason is that Jerusalem's walls have been restored. Yes. It seems like Jerusalem's walls, based on the writing, based on the text of Joel, has been restored. Chapters 2, 7, and 9. So if this is like, might be 300 BC, then it's in the realm where they said God was silent for... Exactly, exactly. And he's not. He he's wasn't. Not. He's so, not. Hey, so this is around the same time. Well, kind of, around the same time that Daniel was written? Right. This was before it. Yeah, because Daniel was like, uh, like third century BC, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, actually, maybe second. Wow. Late wow. second. So, so yeah. Second century BC means 300s, right? 100s. 100s? And during You're right, because 167 BC. Yeah. Go ahead, Carlos. During this time, was it like the... Um, And I keep forgetting, Antioch was a Greek ruler, right? Yes, that was 200 years after this time. Okay. Yeah. So we're still under, and I'm going to bring it up, what Assyrian. empire? Not Assyrian. The Persian. Good. Very good. And there's no external threats. So Assyria is not attacking them. Babylon's not attacking them. Greece is not attacking them. Rome is not attacking them. Even the ten tribes aren't attacking them. There's no external threats. That's what I mean by external. There's no foreign threat against them. So based on these three experiences, it's most likely during the Persian period, which is around this time, 500 to 350 BC. So they're under the rulership of the Persians. When the Persians gave them, told them to go back, all 10, 12 tribes just did what they did, or was it just Judah? It's most likely majority of them was just Judah. But, you know, as Christians, you know how God, um, Luke redeems it? Pentecost. Hmm. You know that prophecy when they come back from the east when, oh, this is so beautiful. But in Hosea 11, when, when God roars like a lion, yeah. like Aslan, and his people come trembling from the east, west, and so that prophecy, as, as early Christians believe, was fulfilled during Pentecost. Pentecost. Because all the Jews from all the oh. world, world come you know, and so forth. And Preacher. what did, huh? <laughs> so, and when they hear it, what do they hear? They hear Peter's preaching. So God uses Peter as the roaring lion. So, so yeah. I love what? the Bible. Wait, wait, wait. Only when it's explained to me, though. <laughs> it needs to be explained, right? That yeah. makes it powerful. That's so. why you're researching and find it for yourself. All right, so, huh? amen, because I think more evangelical Christians should need to know that. They should know that Pentecost was a fulfillment of prophecy. Pentecost was a fulfillment of prophecy. I think Pentecost was a fulfillment of prophecy. Okay, may I continue on? Yeah. All right, major themes that occur in, uh, in good old Joel, or Yoel, uh, adopts motifs of Israelite prophetic traditions prior to him. Okay, and this is great. He has Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Amos, Nahum, not Nahum, Micah. He has all these great prophetic traditions at his disposal. Okay, and some of the things that he brings up is one, the day of the Lord. And we'll talk about the day of the Lord next week, exactly what that looks like in Joel. Because Peter uses Joel in his preaching. Oh my gosh, this is powerful. All right, and continues on. Another motif is judgment of foreign nations. We see that in the major prophets. Remember how Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel judge all the nations and so forth? Yeah. Joel, or Yoel, or Joel does the same thing. <coughs> okay. 
Okay, so these are two primary, um, primary prophetic things that Joel talks about. The day of the Lord and the judgment of the nations. It's a great class. It's a good class, right? The 12 are great. Yeah. I like the 12 sometimes better than Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. I really can't wait to get into Nahum and Obadiah. But don't, don't quote me on that. <laughs> Did you start the recording? I did start the recording. So, yeah, such is life. <laughs> such is life. All right, may I continue on? One more slide, and we're good to go. Yes. Okay? What is the main message of good old Joel? I'm trying to, I try to condense it as much as possible, but this is what I think his main message is. Um, one, he utilizes past prophetic traditions. Why? To convey that much of prophecy has yet to be fulfilled. Much of prophecy has yet to be fulfilled. Where's our, where's our eternal Davidic king, God? Why are we still a puppet kingdom under Persia, God? Why is there still sin in the nation of Israel, God? Why are all these things still happening, God? I thought you promised us that once we come back, everything will be peaches and roses, and I'll have pizza every day and not gain weight. You know what I'm saying? What's going on? So Joel, as a prophet, is attempting to explain why prophecies haven't been fulfilled yet. Okay? But check this out. This guy is so good. He says, but even though they're not being fulfilled, or we, not, we might not have experienced fully their fulfillment, past prophecies are being fulfilled presently, during the prophet's time. <clears throat> so things are happening that God's talked about hundreds and thousands of years before. They're still happening today. Yeah. And then Joel's going to suggest the fulfillment of past prophecy, God's promises, that's another way of saying it, will continue on in the future. So it's not just going to end with us. It's not just going to end with our ancestors. It's not just going to end with me. It's not just going to end with you guys when you get old and decrepit and have your own gravesite. It will continue on until Christ comes back. Amen. Thank you. Okay? That's the power of Joel. Joel is this tiny, tiny book to explain that not all God's, excuse me, that not all God's prophecies Promises have been fulfilled yet, but they will be fulfilled in the future. Future. <coughs> okay? So, I'm out here. Cool beans? All right, that is the message of Joel. Any questions or comments on that? Is it? It is. Oh, wow. Well, I don't know if it's